You're listening to Word Crimes. Welcome to Title 18 Word Crimes. I'm Eric Arneson. On this episode, Mary Wilson reads The Bottom Line by James Grady. Capitol Hill is a geography of mind, will, and luck. James Grady is the author of the classic thriller Six Days of the Condor, which was made into a movie starring Robert Redford and Faye Dunaway, and it was called Three Days of the Condor. He's written more than a dozen other novels, including Last Days of the Condor, Nature of the Game, and Mad Dogs. On top of all that, I can report firsthand that James Grady is also a heck of a nice guy. Now here's Mary Wilson reading The Bottom Line by James Grady, originally published in the anthology DC Noir. The Bottom Line by James Grady The Capitol building glowed in the night like a white icing cake. Can't believe I'm here, thought Joel Rudd as he drove towards that fortress on a hill. Those car wheels rumbled his eyes to the passenger he'd picked up at a prestige downtown hotel. She had the edgy burn of a 1940s movie star, used the name Lena. As they neared Capitol Hill, she said, So you're the senator's number one boy. I'm his administrative assistant, his chief of staff. A long way from boy. Is this ride assisting or administering? Call it the end of a long day. Joel had made his play when the sunset pinked the marble capitol. Legislative Director Dick Harvey and Personal Secretary Mimi sat with Joel on the leather couch in the senator's inner office, sipped cold beers while they waited for their boss. Senator Carl Ness strode into his office, filled a glass with vodka and ice, Here's to us fools on a hill, toasted the senator. We got through another day without wrecking the country. They went over the schedule Mimi'd beamed to the cyber organizer the senator carried, along with two cell phones. The taxpayer provided one for official calls, the private one wrapped in blue tape for calls nobody wanted logged in public records. The senator told Dick and Mimi, Joel will drive me home, meaning leave us now. The senator and Joel sat alone in an office once assigned to assassinated RFK. Senator Ness said, Fuck it. I'm not making gimme money calls tonight. We'll raise enough for re-election, said Joel. Nobody ever has enough cash. The senator frowned. You look shaky. Did you call out to the state today and talk to Joyce? She had that school award thing over in Personville, said her husband. I'll call her after you drop me off tonight. Maybe she'll even pick up the phone. No comment, thought Joel, who knew all about wives, having never had one. We're facing two issues, said Joel. First is the committee vote on the F-77 fighter program. It's down to which firm wins, United Tech or Z Systems. No real differences between either company's bird. The senator shook his head. We got zero enemies with an air force so powerful we need a new warbird. Spring it now, thought Joel. He said, Second, you've got to be Senate sponsor for an aid package, only $8 million in change for refugee camps in Sudan. The senator sighed. Only $8 million, but it'll save 10,000 starving people. Foreigners. Hell, African foreigners. Not our constituents. Our folks are still lucky. High as back home unemployment is, never call them lucky. Our opposition is drooling to smear me as a big spender. A tax-and-spend guy ain't who we can re-elect. Ice clinked in the senator's glass. That trip got to you, didn't it? Joel remembered wails from raped women, now safe inside a barbed wire desert refugee camp, life fading from the face of a skeletal eight-year-old boy, buzzing flies, The senator said, You didn't need to bring me that white canvas sack, like a flower sack, only it's a body bag for dead kids. Didn't need to give me that sack. I wanted you to remember. I already wake up every morning with too much to forget. The senator sipped his drink. You gotta drive tonight. I know. I'll hit the bathroom before we... It's not just me you gotta drive. Joel sank back into the leather chair. I thought we were through with all that. What if there's a problem? Won't be. Out-of-town Joyce won't know. Would probably feel relieved. 
bullshit. Yeah, but it's bullshit that works. The senator looked away. Tonight isn't personal. Oh, great. Who do you want to pick her up? Me? When every cell phone in town has a camera? Some mailroom geek who's got nothing invested in us except a job that pays him less than he could make bartending? A taxi or Uber with logbooks? I didn't sign on for this. It's going to happen. All you get to do is choose how. So, after driving the senator home, Joel played chauffeur. His passenger said, aren't you going to ask? I got no questions for your answers. Bullshit. You're all questions. Probably been getting away with that for years. Why are you a whore? I'm good at it. What's your excuse? I don't need one. I've got a great job. So I see. She looked out the car window. You're driving me. He sped past the senator's huge townhouse, drove into a courtyard of two-story dwellings created as stables and slave quarters. Now most of those boxes were homes for the thin slice of Congress's 20,000-plus employees who lived on Capitol Hill. Joel stopped at the senator's back door, slapped a key onto the dashboard. She scooped up the key. Don't catch cold out here. Long and lean and not looking back, she disappeared into that townhouse rehabbed years after the city-gutting King assassination riots. Joel sped to his own house five blocks away. He lived alone, stood on the maroon rug in his living room with its Smithsonian art prints and National Park Service black-and-white poster of a Mustang in a blizzard. He charged upstairs, wrestled off his tie. The cell phone filled his shirt pocket like a stone. Joel looked out his bedroom window to the night. Capitol Hill is a geography of mind, will, and luck. Gang turf carved by the blades of Congress. What matters on the Hill might not count in Chicago or Paris, not in the mile-away White House or at the Supreme Court, where Joel said the motto etched on that law cathedral should read, equal justice under the five-to-four decision. Yet what happens on Capitol Hill might change the world. As Joel had told his protege Dick, up here, the bottom line never changes. Joel's cell phone rang after 112 minutes. He said, I'll be right there. She stood alone in the night alley. He could have gotten mugged out there, said Joel, as she huddled beside him. Or worse, so what? He sped away from that back door, stopped the car at the end of the alley, idled, Next time, get your boss Café A Viagra. Crimson flames roared in Joel's head. She said, are we going to sit here and stare at the road? Tell me where to go. So much to say, so little time. I need to know, but you never get to. I know what I'm doing. Congratulations, she said. How do you like it so far? Don't fuck with me. I wouldn't take your business. And you're all business. What's your label? Politics? Look, all I want is... He stared out the windshield. Oh, I see. It's about what you want. Her hand pulled on the emergency brake. She drew towards him like a slow-falling star. What are you doing? He said as her face floated closer, closer. Guess. Her mouth covered his. He tasted lightning. She drew back, met his gaze as he managed to say... I thought girls like you never kissed on the mouth. She raged at him, both hands slapping. Joel shook her. Lena's hair flew wild in the streetlight's glow. She fought free, and he let her. She didn't run or look away, and he saw her, felt her shiver. Streets of fire drove them to his living room. She ripped his shirt, wore black lingerie. Her bare legs clamped around Joel's waist as he laid her down on the living room's maroon rug. Two hours, or a lifetime later, they lay naked in the white sheets of his bed. Her hand stroked his cheek. What were your women like yesterday? All I see are characters in movies. How do they look, she said. Smart, funny, successful, pretty. Like the kind of woman a man needs. Couldn't fix them, could you? She said. Don't save me. And don't make me your personal Jesus. Joel smiled. Jesus was a man. Don't be so limited. Who knew you were so full of don'ts? I'm about out, she said. How about you? 
All I know is this is going to drive me crazy. Lena sealed that with her kiss. Come morning, Dick grinned when Joel finally walked past his desk. Got lost coming to work? Whatever, said Joel. What's happening? Money wars, said Dick. We've got three weeks to decide our F-77 vote. What's up with the aid to Sudan bill? They should have waited on that over there, said Dick, nodding towards the house side of the hill. Made sure they had a champion over here. Joel said nothing about his visits to the key house staffer for the bill's author. Nothing about urging speed on the bill. Now, to Dick, he said, polish our armor. The boss went for that? It's the right thing to do, but he's so freaked about re-election, I can't believe he'll stick his neck out on something for nothing. He's not there yet, said Joel, but be ready. Mimi buzzed Joel. The boss wants you. The senator sat behind his desk, looked up as Joel entered the private office. About last night, the senator shrugged. We all have our needs. Really? Joel walked out. The senator's eyes burned Joel's neck through the door he shut behind him. At Mimi's desk, Joel told her, Call Joyce, wherever she is. Get her back in town. Home to her husband? Not likely. Mrs. Senator loves her job as much as he loves his. Re-election on the horizon, gossip about his solo ways. Joyce knows we all gotta do what we all gotta do. The workday wall clock stretched Joel tighter with every sweep of its red second hand. He left the office for home as soon as he could. She showed up seven minutes early. Stood on his stoop, holding a pizza box and a clunky cloth purse. Hair floating free. She wore no makeup or perfume. A hooded sweatshirt under a denim jacket. Torn blue jeans on slim legs and black and white sneakers. This is nothing but me, said Lena. He pulled her inside. Ninety minutes later, they ate cold pizza while sitting naked on his bed. Your arms, she said. How did an indoor guy get such a tan? He told her about Sudan, a refugee camp, the three-day fact-finding trip that he blew up to a two-week tour in hell. The State Department finally insisted he abandon. The worst part was seeing the faces of real people fall away from the helicopter as it lifted me up. I saw their eyes. I saw them believe my promises. You're exactly who belongs in this town. Get out while you can. What about you? Where can I go? I started out letting guys be generous to a hot girl who didn't want a slave labor job or a soul-sucking career. Then one day you realize you've added it up all wrong and you're stuck being your score. Joel cupped her wet face. Who you are right now is all you need. She shook her head no. Remember, Sudan? You've either got power or vultures get you. Plus, the shit I've done has to be worth it. Has to get me beyond it with enough so nobody can touch me. Except you. The best I am is being who you want. Thursday night, she only called to say she couldn't see him. Friday night, her plans were to be not there, but he called her so many times that she relented, said she'd see him around midnight. Lena rang his doorbell at ten minutes into tomorrow, stood on his doorstep looking like a magazine ad, all hair and lips and sheathed legs in a black dress that plunged between her teardrop breasts. Her eyes were broken windows. She stalked upstairs to his bathroom and closed the door. He sat on the bed, listened to the shower run for twenty minutes. The hot water tank must be empty. He found her huddled on the floor of the tub, naked. Icy liquid bullets sprang down on her as she looked at him, sobbed. Not enough soap in the whole damn world. He stepped into the shower and pulled her up, held her in that cold, cold rain. By the next afternoon, smiles softened her jaggedness. They walked past Saturday shoppers who'd come from the Eastern Market food stands, where J. Edgar Hoover sacked groceries as a boy. Joel tried to show her the secret grotto, tucked into the Senate side of the Capitol grounds. But Homeland Security had kicked the terrorist alert level up to yellow. Even his Senate staff ID wasn't enough to get her past SWAT-geared Capitol Hill cops swarming around America's democracy factory. It's okay, she squeezed his hand. Take me home. And he knew she meant to his house. Sunday, she urged him to do one thing she'd never sold, and they did. Monday, he went to work. Getting down, Dick said as he opened a Washington Post on Joel's desk. 
Here on A20, a full-page ad from United Tech salutes their planes with American-built technology. Then on page A24, a quarter-page ad where Z-Systems proudly announces their F-77A simulator performed flight tests with superlative success. And, said Dick, here's an according-to-government sources news story about a General Accountability Office investigation into cost overruns by Z-Systems on their flying tanker. Of course, no mention of which congressman or senator ordered GAO to kick Z-Systems' butt or why the story got leaked. Seen it before, said Joel. Yeah, said Dick. Our boss ambushed me this morning at the coffee pot, told me that he doesn't care which company he votes for. Joel said, did he go off again on re-election? No. But speaking of running, that Sudan relief bill ain't got no legs. They'll show up any day now. Trust me. Always, said Dick. That night, as Joel's kitchen echoed with laughter, Lena's cell phone buzzed. She said, excuse me, walked as far away as she could, came back in ten minutes, said, I've got to go. Left him alone with his nightmares. Tuesday evening, she was sitting on his front stoop with a smile that lit her face. Wednesday, her restlessness woke him with the dawn. She wore only his tattered high school football jersey, told him, I can't do this anymore. Joel felt his ceiling fly away. I can't leave you, said Lena. I can't go back and do what I do. And I won't let my whole life until now add up to worse than nothing. If it's about money, no. If it's your money, then you're just like all the rest. I can't let you be that. What about me? You say you protect yourself against psycho killers and getting, and I have to believe you, but you fuck other men, and it's like you let them rape you. Can't you start all over? He heard the tremor in her voice. Baby, I ain't got the time. All I've done is like a long black cloud swelling up behind me. I'm running out of sky. He held her, and she sobbed. The sun came up, and she lay awake on his heart. Victory at work that day meant he and Dick brokered a deal to give air polluters a 6% rollback of fines, instead of the 17% proposed by his senator's opponents. Joel linked a freelance cameraman he'd cajoled into filming the refugee camp to a network news producer who owed Joel. As he and Dick walked their boss to a roll call, the senator told Joel, Nobody wants your Sudan relief bill. I can't put my brand on a dead horse. Joel pleaded, You can make it work. Senator Ness looked at Joel, shrugged. Later, Dick told Joel, Least he left you with hope. Hope isn't enough on the hill. I know. Up here, the bottom line never changes. It's what you can get done. Dick added, Still, working on the hill is the right thing for guys like us to do. The last best place where we can get paid to fight the good fight. Yeah, said Joel, who'd preached that gospel to Dick once upon a time. After work, Joel found Lena on his couch, her hands wrapped around a bottle of Jack Daniels. I got a phone call today, she said. From your senator. Didn't take it. Joel took a swig of bourbon. I stared at my cell phone screen and realized something. I had his number. Leave him out of this. Leave him alone. No, he's in this with us. He's got my number, but I've got his. And the number of the guy who hooked up me and the senator. What guy? said Joel. This guy, this lobbyist. He's gay, so no business between us. Don't know how. But he hooked up with your senator. I can't be with him all the time, said Joel. What's the guy's name? Frank Green. A bulldog who wore Wall Street suits. Joel said, I didn't know Frank was gay. It's not who he is, said Lena. It's what he offered me. She leaned closer. Frank told me that... If I could get the senator to tell me who he was going to vote for on a military planes contract, the F-77 authorization bill. Yeah. Frank offered me $5,000 if I got your boss to say who he was voting for. Joel took a swig from the bottle. My idea, she said, is that if five grand is a fee for just knowing about a deal, what would it be worth to a guy like Frank to be able to broker that deal? Joel's stomach churned sour acid. You told me all about it, said Lena. 
It's not like this vote makes any difference. It's not about America or national defense or fighting evil. We can't be about this. We're not. We're about us. This is about getting us free. It's for you. Yeah, it's for me. And you said you want me. I'll always be who I was, but this way I have something to show for it. This buys me a getaway. Here. Not enough, he whispered. We're not worth enough to do this. What other chance do we have? I'm changing my life for us. What about you? He walked to his window full of night, stared out at the city he'd chosen to make his home. He searched the darkness outside, faced what he'd never embraced. Only one way we can do this, said Joel. We need to make doing what's wrong be for more right than just us. After he told her how, she said, I'll set it up. Won't work, he said. Frank won't believe just you. By just you. I don't want you touching, he stroked her hair. Too late? Joel nodded to her cell phone. Make the call. What about the senator? Nobody needs him, said Joel. But two nights later, Joel sat in his car with the bulldog in a Wall Street suit who said, Hey, fucko, I need the senator. Across the street from this car waited Capitol Hill's neighborhood barfield-sized Lincoln Park that 198 years ago after the Declaration of Independence became D.C.'s first public site for any statue honoring a woman or an African-American. It's not about what you need, said Joel. It's about what I can do. You don't get to vote in committee or on the floor. Not in the flesh, but I'm the spirit moving the man. This sounds full of people who died thinking they were somebody else. You get close to him, said Joel. The odds go up that we'll all get caught. Frank Green drummed his fingers on Joel's dashboard. One hundred thousand dollars. My price includes more than cash. There's a relief bill for Sudan that's come over from the house on a wing and a prayer. You're going to angel that prayer. Muscle that bill into a workable law. This is a money town and you want me to save the world? What's the catch? No catch but I get to deliver my guy to lead the charge in the Senate. One hand cleans the other, huh? Yellow headlights silhouetted them sitting in the car as a cop drove past two more men sharing secrets in D.C.'s dark night. Believe what you gotta believe, said the bulldog, but deliver what you sell. Don't you trust me? Joel shook his head at the man's silence. Me too. That's why I have to see motion on your side before I deliver for mine. What do you mean, motion? I call you in a few days, tell you which company, you lock your man down, I deliver the cash through the babe. Never call her again. If you see her on the street, walk on by, and make me see what I need to see. On the following Wednesday, Mimi dropped a Dear Colleague letter on Joel's desk, a mass mailing to all lawmakers on Capitol Hill from the congressman who'd authored the Sudan relief measure and was now proud to announce that a caucus of business and labor groups had organized to support the bill. Letter in hand, Joel walked to the suite Mimi shared with press secretary Ricky. Mimi was on the phone. Good to talk to you, Glenn, Mimi mouthed the last name Parker to Joel. The senator will be sorry to have missed your call, but Joel's standing right here. Joel took the phone. Glenn, how are you? How I am is stuck. Not sure we should be talking legally. The law says there's no problem with a citizen calling his senator's office, one time anyway. They let guys like us touch base for free. Free, Glenn laughed. Then FYI, a bunch of the senator's friends out here, plus some folks back in D.C., just formed an independent educational committee so voters realize who to touch the computer screen for next time. Dead air filled the phone call between the senator's D.C. office and the bank president's phone back home in the capital of the senator's state. Until Joel said, That sounds like great news, but you're right. It's possibly of a partisan political campaign nature, so we can't talk about it on this publicly funded phone or from this taxpayer's owned office. Joel legally gave him a phone number for the townhouse that the party's senatorial campaign committee rented across the street from the Senate, told Glenn to call him there in an hour. Mimi said, is this one of those things I don't know about? Joel knocked on the brown door to the senator's private suite, didn't wait for a come in before he did, and closed the door behind him. Senator Carl Ness sat with suit jacket off, tie loosened, three cell phones and cyber organizer on the massive desk as he worked his way through a stack of papers. You talked to Glenn Parker recently, said Joel. The senator shrugged. 
Joyce ran into him at that Bay City pancake breakfast for the Girl Scouts, and I suppose they chatted about how things are and how they could be better. God bless the First Amendment. People can talk. Did you give Joyce her script? She's been out this a long time. She knows what to say. The senator smiled. What are you upset about? None of us left any fingerprints. Don't ever pull a stunt like that again without first running it by me. Hey, I am the senator. He raised his hand. Point taken, but this is a done deal. Joel dropped the Dear Colleague Sudan letter on his boss's desk. If you lead the charge for that bill over here, you're going to make a lot of important people happy. Who will I make mad? Nobody who can hurt you. The senator leaned back in his chair. We live in a brutal world. It's incumbent upon us as Americans and human beings to do all we can to help innocent men and... No, innocent children who violence, evil, and greed have blah, blah, blah. The senator raised a warning finger. Don't get me in trouble on this. Me? said Joel. Get you in trouble? That's not the way it's always been. Later, walking back from the campaign committee's house, Joel detoured to a Union Station payphone. He called the bulldog, said, Yes. You can still back out, whispered Lena that night in his bed. No, we can't, said Joel. The U.S. mail brought a package to his home the next day, a disposable cell phone that buzzed in his pocket three days later. Joel put the cell phone to his ear. A bulldog said, Is this who it should be? Probably, said Joel. Z Systems, said the bulldog. I repeat, Z Systems. After work that night, Joel arranged to go out for a beer with Dick and their committee staffer, Trudy. They went to one of only four bars that survived the tsunami of ferns and cloth napkins gentrification that laundered Capitol Hill in the 1990s, a booths and stools joint with Hank Williams wannabes in the jukebox. A stuffed owl spread its wings above the bar mirror. Congressional aides loved the bar. It reminded them of a blue-collar real world they imagined they could still claim as their roots. Is it just me, said Trudy, or are we the oldest Hill staffers in here? Congress runs on the blood of 25-year-olds, said Joel. Guys two jumps up like us are usually thinking about getting out, back to the real world and on to big bucks. Trudy asked, how many people on your staff are from D.C.? One, said Joel. We aren't like ordinary factory towns, said Dick. We aren't like any towns anywhere, said Joel. They drank cold beer. Joel let the committee staffer Trudy think it was her idea to meet with the senator. Those four playmakers huddled the next morning. Senator Ness said, give me your recommends. The company's planes are essentially equal, said Trudy, but the future looks best with United Tech. United's bird is more bucks per copy, but Z-Systems' bid is a low estimate they'll recoup in cost overruns. Plus, Z-Systems has that GAO probe. Dick said, are you telling us that United Tech is more honest than Z-Systems? Even Trudy laughed. I say that the GAO investigation of Z-Systems means they're the best choice, said Dick. They won't be so inclined to try a rip while the watchdogs are in their shop. Plus, Z-Systems is the cheaper right now, and we pay for our pick with right-now dollars. The senator said, Joel? Read the headline, said Joel. Senator Ness votes against low bidder on jillion-dollar contract. It's hard to explain to the voters why it looks like you chose to overspend their tax dollars. I say it comes down to good politics married to good government. If you add up everything, your best choice is Z-Systems. Makes sense, said the senator. Okay, said Dick. Z-Systems it is. How about I draft a letter of commitment to the committee chairman? Trudy said, great idea. Yeah, Dick, said the senator, except I'm voting for United Tech. Dick blurted, you said Z-Systems made sense. But, said the senator, as Joel fought terror, it makes more sense and better government to build for the future. The political stuff's got to take a back seat. Dick said, so do I draft the letter? By time, Joel said. Let's think that play through. Hold off until tomorrow. Joel walked the senator to a vote, then hurried through the tunnels, honeycombing the hill beneath the Capitol to use the campaign committee phone and call back home banker Glenn Parker. Glenn, our friends in your new group, said Joel. Are they a bunch of guys from United Tech? Glenn said, no. Are we expecting any? Beats me, said Joel. It's a free country. That night he sat on his living room couch with Lena. 
Street lamps filtering through his dirty windows cut across them with light and shadows. After the senator bucked me for United, knowing that committee had just formed out in the state, I thought maybe I'd catch him having done his own side deal. He's played cagey like that before. Joel shook his head. But now he's choosing what's best for the country. The hell with re-election. That's why I went to work for him. He may be a personal jerk, but he stands up for what he believes. The damn son of a bitch. What if you can't get the senator to change his mind, said Lena. Then we're fucked. You could make it up to Frank Green on some other vote, some other time. There is no other time, said Joel. If I fuck him on this, he'll need to fuck me. Plus more. To keep his pride, his clout, keep himself safe. What are you talking about, she said. This is a tough town. Joel woke up under a cloudy sky. He let Mimi play out the morning office rituals, then told the senator, Change your mind. Go for Z-Systems. Let's get Dick in on this, said the senator, pushing the intercom button. After Dick joined them, the senator said, Joel wants me to change my mind and go with Z-Systems. Dick asked Joel, Why? United Tech is the future, but today is tomorrow. Dick shrugged. Whatever that means, we agree. Senator Ness sighed. Okay, I'll vote for Z-Systems. Let's get on to the stuff we can give a shit about. I think I can get TV showing you rescuing starving kids, said Joel. He wanted to shout for joy. He wanted to cry for shame. He did his job, called the TV producer with news. That prompted the producer to ask for a deadline chance Joel granted. Joel Dick, press secretary Ricky, and the senator huddled in his office. Just because they film our guy doesn't mean they'll use it, said Ricky. Great visuals have a better chance of making the news menu, said Joel. Plus, if it bleeds, it leads, but I've got it. The white sack, said Joel. The burial bag for kids from the refugee camp. Perfect, said Ricky. Picture it, senator, said Joel. You take the usual interview, sit down, they want to film this afternoon, wait for the right moment, then pull the white sack out of your suit jacket pocket. That gives them action and the illusion of a gotcha. News film is all about gotchas. You'll be anointed a caring, crusading hero on network TV. Ricky said, so where's the sack? The three aides looked at the senator, who said, um... Joel snapped. Don't tell me you lost it. The senator said, then creeped me... Wait, it's on the pile to get auctioned off at a fundraiser or shipped to the state university's archives. The sack's at my house. Joel said, the interview's in three hours. You've got agriculture markup in 25 minutes you can cut out early. Dick, do that commitment letter now. Get him out of the committee meeting with plenty of time for you two to get to his place. Get the sack. Come back. I like the idea of you two walking. It'll roughen up for the camera. 17 minutes later, Dick showed Joel the commitment letter. Z-Systems it is, said Joel. Make him sign it, run copies, and bring it all to me. As soon as he was done, Joel dialed the disposable cell phone. Yeah, said the bulldog who answered Joel's call. Yeah, said Joel. Now what about the rest of your end? Ninety minutes. Your house. He hung up before Joel could say no. Joel punched in a second phone number. When Lena answered her cell, he asked, Where are you? Your place. Where else? Get out of there. The bulldog is on his way. Knock on Joel's office door, and Dick came in. Our boss signed the line. I'll walk you two over. Joel put the signed letter and copies in his suit pocket. Dick's frown said he thought that was peculiar, but hey, they were on the move. Joel made sure they entered the right hearing room, then hurried outside. An ocean of gray clouds rolled over the Capitol Dome. Wind flapped Joel's suit jacket as he walked past Capitol Hill cops, past tourists who were realizing that visiting Capitol Hill was like hiking to a kabuki play, but not understanding Japanese. An orange public school bus crammed with inner-city D.C. kids passed him on the way to their classroom that had a hole in its ceiling the size of a coffin. He found Lena in his living room. I won't let you do this alone, she said. Why is he coming here? To show me he knows where I live. Can we get away? Sure, he said. Anywhere you want to go. Here, she said, nuzzling his chest. I want to go right here. After this, it can be just us. He felt her nod. I can be somebody else. I can dye my hair. The doorbell rang. Raindrops spit at Joel when he let the bulldog into his house. The lobbyist stared at them. You two make a hell of a pair. Don't you talk about us. Lena hugged her arms across her chest. Frank Green shrugged. What do you got for me? Joel handed him a photocopy. As the bulldog studied that piece of paper, Joel heard the clatter of wind and rain storming against his living room windows. Our turn, said Lena. 
About that, the bulldog tossed a thick envelope to Lena. Tough luck. What do you mean, said Joel. Changing circumstances require compromises. Means that your appropriation is cut 50% to 50 thou. You can't screw us just because you can, said Lena. 50k is way more than you've been paid for screwing before. The lobbyist turned to the Senate aide, shrugged in a fashion that an amateur might mistake for an apology. This town, what can you do? I didn't sign on for this, said Joel. You signed up for everything the moment you let her in your car. Stop it, screamed Lena. The bulldog thrust his finger at her. You don't give orders. Joel pushed the lobbyist's arm away from Lena. What are you going to do, growled the bulldog. You got what I gave you. Joel replied, and all you've got for sure is a piece of paper. Oh, you think so? The bulldog snapped at Lena. You think so, too? Shut up. She shook the envelope in Green's face. You think I did it for this? Lena threw the envelope away. It landed on the couch by her bulky cloth purse. Why you did whatever is your problem. Joel said, leave her alone. Oh, come on, said the bulldog. Don't you get it? Joel said, I get that we've only gotten half of what was promised. You sure you want the rest? Shut up! Lena lunged towards the couch, her purse, the money envelope. You can't fuck with us like this. Babe, getting fucked is your whole life. Not now. Lena cradled the envelope and her clunky purse. Not for us. Whoa, stop the way the world's been working, because suddenly you decided you got yourself an us? Let's see. No, don't. Like a mad dog, the lobbyist whirled to Joel. You want it all? Shut up, said Lena. Stop. The bulldog surged towards her. Joel growled. You want what you really got? Out of her purse jerked Lena's hand, holding a snub-nosed revolver. Bam! Window panes flashed and vibrated with the gunshot. From outside, all that seemed only like the storm. Joel knew he must have heard the bang, seen the gunshot flash, but he felt like he fell back into himself after having been far away. Now suddenly, he was right here, in his living room, Lena holding a pistol, Frank Green clutching his left side. You bitch, yelled Frank. Gonna kill you. Frank staggered towards her. Bam! Bam! Frank crumpled to the maroon rug. Window panes rattled. Lena whispered, It shot him. Joel crouched to touch the lobbyist's motionless neck. Then Joel's hand shook and wouldn't stop. His whole body trembled. Lena pulled him up to her embrace. I'll call the police, she said. Tell them the truth. What good would that do? Even you can't fix this. But it can be managed. Joel, no. What he did, said, what he was going to... What matters is what happens right now, Joel told her. He filled her eyes as she told him. I never thought it would go this way. I love you. Yeah, but now that's not enough. He pocketed the gun, had her help him roll the dead man up in the maroon rug. Joel put on a hooded raincoat, ran outside in the deluge, drove his car into the alley, parked by his trash cans. Lena let him in the back door, helped him shoulder the rolled-up maroon rug, stagger through the rain, crammed the rug into his car's trunk. Inside his house, water dripped off them to tap on the bare wood floor. Take the money. He stuffed the envelope in her cloth purse. Go home. You weren't here. Barely know me. I'll call when it's safe. He drove her to nearby Union Station, stopped where the few people running past them had eyes only for their own escape from the storm. Go, he told her crying eyes. I'll call as soon as I can. She hugged him so tight he almost died, ran from his car towards the subway escalator, turned to look back at him through gray sheets of driving rain. He memorized her, standing there, washed by all the tears in town, the escalator fed her to the underground. Go, he told himself. No speeding tickets. No accidents. Off the hill. Virginia? Maryland? A country road, a quarry filled by a dead lake. A ditch with rocks that could be rolled. Wipe the gun. Throw the wallet. Cell phones. Cell phones. What is it about? Never mind. Ditch evidence everywhere but on the hill. Ring. His cell phone. Not the disposable he'd need to dump. Can't not answer. Dick's voice in his ear. Joel, where the hell are you? Sell the truth when you can. In my car, on the hill, got places to go. Yeah, said Dick. Like here to the boss's house, pronto. Why? Because of the rain, man. It's like a hurricane. But no buts or our butts are in a sling. We got here just as it started spitting. 
Finding the white sack took a while. Now we got to get back to the Capitol in time for the interview in the TV press gallery. Looking rough for a good TV cue is cool, but looking like a drowned rat blows, so you need to swing by here and give us a ride. What about the senator's car? In the shop and in the storm, no way we can get a taxi. If you don't come get us, we'll lose the chance to get the Sudan bill on TV and spin PR we need to win. Rain drummed the roof of Joel's car, flooded his windshield. Yeah, he said into the cell phone. Ness has got to take this ride. Joel double-parked in front of the senator's townhouse. Two men hurried through the rain to his car. The senator wore a trench coat, jumped in the front seat. Dick tumbled into the back. Where's your umbrella, said Joel. Somebody else always has one, said the senator. Go, said Dick. We're going to be late. Joel stepped on the gas. Clump. Dick said, what was that? The rearview mirror showed Dick turning to look towards the car's trunk. D.C. streets, blurted Joel. Roughest roads around. Joel steered his car into a right turn on red. Water whooshed under his tires. Potholes slammed the wheels. The wipers went womp womp. Turn on the defrost, ordered the senator. You can barely see. The engine fan whirred an invisible wind up the fogged windshield. Look out, yelled Dick. A yellow smear slid past their surging forward car. You almost hit that cop, said Dick. A neon red starburst filled Joel's windshield. What the hell, said Dick, as Joel slammed on the brakes. Three Capitol Hill cops in yellow rain slickers blocked the road. One cop stabbed a popped flare into the wet mirror blacktop. Two others stalked toward the halted vehicle. Joel lowered his window. Spray from the storm wet his face. Sir, shut off your vehicle, yelled the older cop, while the younger officer kept his right hand thrust inside his yellow slicker. Now! A laser dot of red light reflected through the windshield to kiss Joel's chest. Joel shifted to park and killed his engine. The red dot danced on Joel's chest as two cops stalked to the side of the car. Sir, yelled the lead cop, the officer back there ordered you to halt. I didn't see him. I'm driving Senator Ness. The older cop snapped a flashlight beam on the senator's face. Gonna be all right, thought Joel. Gonna make it now. He's him, said the cop's younger partner. Sorry, senator, said the ranking officer. I didn't see you, but doesn't matter. Homeland Security just bumped us up to orange alert. Fuck Homeland Security, yelled the senator. This is Capitol Hill. I'm a senator. We're in charge. Let us pass. Sir, our scenarios include a senator being snatched in a terrorist attack. That's ridiculous. So is four jetliners being hijacked into flying bombs. I'm sorry, but you entered our secured zone, so now you all have to step out of the vehicle before you proceed. Joel yelled, in this damn storm? Come on, said Dick. We can still make it. That black Senate staffer stepped out of the car, kept his hands in plain sight. Fuck me. The senator stepped into the rain. Through the water-blurred windshield, Joel saw three more yellow-slickered cops march toward the car. One carried an umbrella, one carried a pole with a mirror for examining the underside of vehicles. The senior cop told the driver, everyone must exit the vehicle. Joel Rudd stood on the road, arms out like Jesus, face turned up to the falling rain. Senator Carl Ness stood under an umbrella held by a yellowed slickered cop and, like his law-writing aide, Dick Harvey, stared at the Capitol Hill wizard they worked with, who suddenly seemed to have gone insane. Sir, we need to pop the trunk, check it, then you can go. No, said Joel. I'm going nowhere. I'm already there. The older cop said, we're just following the rules. Joel turned his flooded face toward that guardian of law and order. Rules. I know about them. In my trunk, you'll find a body. What? chorused the cop, the U.S. senator, and his legislative director. A lobbyist named Frank Green. Shot dead. Rain beat down on them. Flares sputtered. Police radios crackled routine reports. Until a cop opened Joel's trunk, announced, He's right. The younger cop slid his hand back inside his yellow slicker. An officer lifted his radio, but his sergeant ordered, Keep this off the air. Senator Ness yelled at Joel, What have you done? Joel stared at the man he knew so well, had served so long. A thousand calculations churned behind the senator's frantic expression. Through the raging storm, Joel saw the spirit inside that man as clearly as he saw the spirit in himself. Carl Ness reached inside his suit and pulled out a white sack. Do you see what you've done? said the politician. Do you see what you've put at risk? Ten thousand lives, and you stand there flushing them down the drain. A cop exchanged his radio for his cell phone. The senator took the white sack. 
Now it'll take all I've got to make this happen. Suddenly, Joel saw it all through the pouring rain. Cell phone. Fingerprints. The cell phone in the cop's hands as he reported it in. The third cell phone on the senator's desk, when there should have been only two. A sequence where a bulldog and a politician set up a shaky crusader with a desperate dream girl who they'd schooled. Joel positioned to structure the corrupt deal over the senator's opposition in front of witnesses Trudy and Dick. If anyone ever cried corruption, the guilty fingerprints would belong to fall guy Joel. The senator's independent campaign committee set up to reap a windfall from the contract winners. The payoff to Joel and Lena was chump change to distract him, keep him quiet, drive more nails into his frame. The white sack waited in the senator's fist for what Joel would say. The whole unprovable public truth wouldn't save Joel, would cut the balls off a senator so he kept his job but had no power, would thus sentence 10,000 people to starvation, destroy a woman desperate to be free. Capitol Hill's bottom line, it's what you can get done. Thunder boomed. Joel never saw the flash. His words tasted like smoke. The creep got shot because he welched on paying me for fixing the warplane vote. Wait, said the youngest cop, shouldn't we read him his rights? No one can prove me wrong, thought Joel, or will want to. Clarity shimmered through the hissing red glow of the flares, the spinning blue and blood lights on arriving police cars, the storm-slick skull-white glow off the Capitol Dome. Joel envisioned Lena, grimly marching through a D.C. airport. He wondered where she'd go. The color of her hair. My fall, yelled Joel. What did he say? yelled the older cop, whose partner yelled back. He said it was his fault. But Senator Ness's face said he heard Joel's offer. A look of pure understanding passed between them. Like a noble boss of a doomed sinner, the senator told Joel, I'll do all I can. Joel's nod sealed their redemptive bargain. Cuff him, ordered the older cop. Bare steel clamped around Joel's wrists. Dick Harvey lunged toward the prisoner who'd taught him how democracy works. Murder, said Dick, the word burning in his eyes. I get that. But how could you, you of all people, how dare you sell out all the best dreams up here? Joel said, bottom line, it's what I can do. That was The Bottom Line by James Grady, read by Mary Wilson. Here are a few things I bet you didn't know about James Grady. In 1971, he was a staffer working on the Montana Constitutional Convention, which led to Montana adopting a new state constitution in 1972. Someday, I am going to get my political geek completely on and talk to James Grady about that constitutional convention. Uh, he also worked for a time with renowned investigative journalist Jack Anderson, and he sold the book Six Days of the Condor at age 24 while living in a converted garage in Missoula, Montana. And I know I said this before, but it bears repeating. James Grady is also a heck of a nice guy. Mary Wilson, also extremely nice, is a reporter and producer at Slate's The Gist. You can find her on Twitter at Mary Wilson. That's it for this episode. Thank you for listening to Word Crimes. You can find complete show notes for this episode, including links to James Grady's books and much more, and our entire back catalog of podcast episodes at wordcrimespodcast.com. All of our back episodes are also available and free on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you enjoy Word Crimes, please take a minute to rate us on iTunes. It will make us feel good, and you will help other people learn about this podcast. You can find me at ericarneson.com. That's E-R-I-K-A-R-N-E-S-O-N.com. The site includes information about my first book, a short story collection called The Throes of Crime. It features 26 short stories and six true crime essays, and all proceeds from The Throes of Crime go to a scholarship fund. I'm also at Eric Arneson on Twitter and easy to find on Facebook. The music on this episode is by The Throws. You can find them at The Throws, T-H-R-O-E-S, thethrows.com. Thanks again for listening to Title 18 Word Crimes. We'll be back soon with more great crime fiction. <laughs>